Welcome back to Proxam, everybody, and today we're going to be reviewing and ranking every Elder Aspect Warrior in 10th edition so far. So, as you guys know, way back when the edition first came out, I did a pretty extensive Aspect Warrior series covering every single Aspect Warrior in our index, the strengths, their weaknesses, the different combos and synergies that they could be a part of, and how to use them on the battlefield. But I did think that it was time for a retouch. There's been a lot of changes in the game, a lot of changes in the meta and so forth, and our understanding of the units has greatly deepened. And in my mind, there's no better time than right before a new data slate when everything could get thrown up in the air. So without further ado, let us continue on to the video. So in this video, we're going to be looking at the Aspect Warrior journey so far in 10th edition, the different changes that have occurred over the course of the edition since the summer. And then we're going to go into a brief synopsis of every Aspect Warrior in the Elder Index, and we're going to take a step further and we're going to rank them from best to worst. All right, so what has the Aspect Warrior journey looked like so far in 10th edition? So as some of you guys might know, in the beginning of the 10th edition, a lot of people were disappointed that Aspect Warriors seemingly got nerfed. Especially on this channel, I got a lot of complaints from a lot of different players saying Aspect Warriors are so much worse now. Yes, they're, you know, cheaper, but we feel more like a horde army now. And, you know, I just am not enjoying the look of Aspect Warriors in 10th edition. However, what I noticed specifically was that Aspect Warriors in 9th edition, even though they did a lot of damage, were basically very one-dimensional. And a great example of this is Dire Avengers. Dire Avengers in 9th edition were an extremely one-dimensional unit, especially when played in Hail of Doom lists. And, you know, even though a lot of people liked Hail of Doom, and I had really kind of nothing super against Hail of Doom, in 9th edition, I just thought it was a very boring thing because you just saw lists that had a bunch of the same unit in it spammed over and over and over again. So what 10th did is 10th reimagined Aspect Warriors and made them very good at a specific task. And that task isn't always just doing raw damage, which is what I actually liked and I actually found it refreshing. And for the most part, a lot of the Aspect Warriors in 10th edition did perform much better for their point cost. A couple come to mind that I will talk about in this video, one being Dark Reapers. However, that's not to say that some Aspect Warriors didn't get the shaft. There are certain units that did get hit very hard and really didn't get a lot of benefits in return, which we will also talk about. So after a couple of months, after the meta kind of settled in, we saw a true resurgence of aspects in competitive play. In the beginning of 10th edition, everybody was running the Devastating Wound spam, the Wraith Knights, the D-Cannons, and they really weren't focused on Aspect Warriors. The only Aspect Warriors that really showed up in competitive play were Warp Spiders and Shadow Spectres. Warp Spiders, because they were extremely fast, could perform secondaries, but also did Devastating Wounds as well. And Shadow Spectres being, you know, the unit that could move and shoot. Right, So like built-in battle focus, which is always strong. So those two units were, you know, obviously prevalent in the beginning of the edition, but no other aspects really see or saw any play. However, as the edition went on, we did see some nerfs to those really, you know, oppressive Eldar units. And Aspect Warriors really came into their own and started flourishing in people's lists. And now we're seeing all sorts of different aspects come into play which has been a really awesome thing to see. And, you know, of course, we still have the, you know, standard cookie cutter competitive Eldar lists running the three Night Spinners and the Yinkarn. You know, that's the standard competitive list for Eldar right now. But when those two things get nerfed in the data slate, I think we're going to see a lot more different Aspect Warriors come into play. All right, so let us go ahead and dive right into the brief synopsis of every Aspect Warrior in the Eldar Index and we're going to rank them from best to worst. So starting off at the best Aspect Warrior in the Index is, in my opinion, the Shadow Spectres. Now, this might be a little bit debated because a lot of people do like Warp Spiders and Swooping Hawks and Fire Dragons. Those units are all very good, no doubt. But I think Shadow Spectres kind of clinch the first spot for best Aspect Warrior at the moment. So what are Shadow Spectres? So they're a pretty mobile, flying, movement 12, infantry unit. 
They're medium range. They have 24 inch guns that have two different damage profiles. One is actually 24 inches, which is the focused. Then they have the 18 inch dispersed shot, which is good against infantry. So they can realistically deal with heavy, medium, and light infantry all in one small package, which makes them extremely powerful being able to deal with a lot of different enemy units, especially in the competitive scene where you don't necessarily know what you're going to be going up against. On top of that, they can move six inches after shooting just like scourges, making them very hard to pin down and very frustrating to play against. And their weapons are extremely potent. Weirdly so, because most dual role units that have dual profiles on their weapons usually either have a worse profile on one of them, or both of their profiles are slightly less efficient than their counterparts in other weapon systems. So a good example of that is the Eldar heavy weapons. The Eldar missile launcher, for example, is, you know, an anti-tank platform and an anti-infantry platform, but it is both worse than Bright Lance at anti-large and worse than the scatter laser, shuriken cannon, or, you know, even star cannon at dealing with enemy infantry. And that's the trade-off, right, that you get with the versatility of the weapon, but Shadow Spectres don't have that trade-off, they're just good no matter which profile you pick. Obviously, there are going to be mathematically better choices against certain opponents, but both of them are great options. Whether you want to cut down Terminators with their damage 3 focus blasts, or you want to cut down swathes of light infantry with their blast dispersed profiles, which, by the way, a unit of 5 will be able to generate 5d6 plus 4 or 5 shots against a unit of guardsmen with attached command squad, which is absolutely insane. That's an insane amount of attacks to be rolling against any kind of infantry squad for only being 5 models that only cost 95 points. Shadow Spectres are very cheap, and, you know, realistically, after they're done killing their target, they can still move 6 inches and be safe to do the same thing the next turn. But even though they do have that immense hitting power, they are a shorter ranged unit. 24 inches is pretty good, but that's only one of their profiles. 18 inches is quite a bit shorter, and this can make them vulnerable to enemy shooting and overwatch. So you do have to watch out for that. They are still a, you know, unit with a single wound. They're Eldar, their toughness three. They do have a three plus save. They do have minus one to hit, but a strong overwatch will knock most of them out. So they are still very much a skillful unit to use if you want to make the most out of them. Okay, coming in at number two, we have Warp Spiders. So Warp Spiders, I think, easily take the number two spot. They're fast. They also hit very hard with their ranged weapons, and they auto-hit because they're torrent. So Warp Spiders are a fast jump aspect that specializes in lightning strikes and short-ranged area denial. They can move 24 inches in the movement phase alone, and that's on top of things like Fire and Fade and Phantasm. And, of course, their weapons do have a short range at 12, but they have Torrent and Devastating Wounds, giving them a brutal overwatch, which makes them really good at denying certain areas of the board, which is why you see a lot of Warp Spiders in competitive lists. Because a lot of players are going to be unwilling to move a lone operative into a certain area of the board to score on an objective if Warp Spiders are nearby. However, they do have their weaknesses like every other aspect. They do have a very short range, which makes them extremely prone to overwatch. So you do have to move them carefully and make sure that when they end their movement, they're out of line of sight. And of course, when they start their movement, they're also out of line of sight. So that is something you do need to pay attention to with Warp Spiders because they do die quickly like most Eldar units. And because they're 115 points a unit as well, they are very expensive, and they will set you back if you lose them in the first couple turns of the game. So, number three has to go to Swooping Hawks. Now, Swooping Hawks were a pretty underutilized unit in the beginning of 10th edition, but when I saw their profile and I saw how fast they could move and all the different tricks they could do in the very beginning, I loved these guys. And I thought that, you know, arguably, they were even better than they were last edition. And of course, they were the basically staple in a lot of competitive lists in ninth. But now we're seeing them show up in multiple tournament lists, and now they've become quite a staple in competitive play. So Swooping Hawks are a fast flying aspect that specializes in rapid deployment and mobility. 
Their ability Sky Leap allows them to appear anywhere on the battlefield turn after turn to score on objectives. You basically get to put them in Deep Strike every turn, and that is extremely powerful. Not only that, but they do have pretty effective anti-infantry weapons with baked-in lethal hits and four attacks apiece, so if you need them to clear a unit of cultists off of a back objective, or you need them to, you know, help kill something that's a little bit tougher, you just need a couple more wounds on something, they can do it. They do have their weaknesses, however, and that they're fragile and they're prone to getting sky leap screened. So that is something you do have to keep in mind with them, is that, you know, a good opponent will screen out your sky leaps so that you can't get to certain areas of the battlefield as easily as you might want to. And up for number four, we have Fire Dragons. So Fire Dragons are a short-ranged aspect that specializes in turning large targets to slag. And Fire Dragons are my favorite unit. I've loved them for a very long time, ever since really third edition when I started playing. I always wanted a huge unit of Fire Dragons, even though at the time... They weren't that great back in 3rd edition. Now they are better used in small units and they get to reroll ones to wound and ones on their damage, which is a very unique thing to fire dragons against large targets, that is monsters and vehicles, allowing them to punch up considerably. And they are a pretty cheap unit at 85 points. They're no longer the whopping 140 that they were in 9th edition. The Melta special rule does additional damage within short range. They have Melta 3, making them reliable, destroying a wide array of multi-wound targets as well. So basically, you get to auto-kill 4-wound models and almost auto-kill anything with 5 wounds or 6 wounds. And do remember that they do get to reroll 1s on the damage, so even 5-wound models are pretty much not very safe against a Fire Dragon's fusion gun. Their weaknesses, however, are that they do have extremely short-range weapons and need to get very close for extra damage. So, you know, they do have a, an extremely high AP. Melta 3 makes them extremely damaging against a large array of targets, but they do need to get very close, which often means they do need the support of a Falcon transport to make sure that they can get where they need to go. And you probably want to give them a Falcon anyway, just because of the fact that, you know, you get to reroll all wound rolls when coming out of a Falcon against a specific target. So overall, though, a fantastic and very cost-effective unit that is good at dealing with a wide array of heavy targets. Up next is Dire Avengers. So Dire Avengers are coming in at number 5. They are a defensive medium-range shooting aspect that specializes in board and objective control. They do overwatch on a 5 plus normally or a 4 plus when on an objective that you control. Only one of them actually needs to be on the objective, but you do need to control it. They have lethal hits, 3 attacks apiece, and AP-1 base at range, and this ensures that their overwatch hits hard against most non-large targets in the game. However, if they do happen to survive past the point where your opponent is forced to move their vehicles or monsters out into no man's land with only a couple wounds left on them, they can chip a few wounds off of them as well with the lethal hits. Now, the Dire Avengers' main weakness is that their ability does incentivize them being on objectives, which can make them an easy target. And even though Overwatch on 5 plus does sound really good, mathematically it's just not that good. You really want to get that 4 up, and typically you want to run these guys in big blobs to kind of maximize that Overwatch effect. Now I know that some people like running them in 5 mans, which is also very good. They are a solid unit at dealing with infantry, but again, their weakness is that they do have an ability that incentivizes aggressive and objective control style play. Which, if you're not careful, can lead them to being shot to pieces out in the open with no support. So you do have to be careful about when and where you decide to place them on the battlefield. Coming in at number 6, we have Striking Scorpions. So Striking Scorpions are easily the best melee aspect in our index at the moment. They are a melee aspect warrior that specializes in eliminating infantry and board control with their infiltrate. So they do have devastating wounds and sustained hits, which allows them to hit harder than their AP value would suggest. They have AP zero on their weapons normally, but those devastating wounds cleave through invuls and armor alike. As long as they're fighting against infantry. Now their sustained hits is against everything, but their devastating wounds is only against infantry, so you do need to watch out for that. Don't charge these guys into a vehicle thinking that you can deal devastating wounds to it. 
Infiltrate does give them a lot of positional advantage and board control as well in the early game, and they're not that much more expensive than Rangers. Rangers are only 55 points, which is the cheapest unit in our index, and of course, Striking Scorpions are 75, which is more expensive, but then again, Scorpions do a lot more damage than Rangers are capable of. Their weaknesses, however, are that, again, the Devastating Wounds is only against infantry, and they are vulnerable if you don't get the first turn. So if you do not get the first turn, oftentimes these guys have to play more conservatively and you may not get the jump on an enemy unit that you wished you could have. And also currently we don't have any way to redeploy units after determining who gets first turn. So that is a little bit risky. You kind of risk kind of leaving your striking scorpions open if you don't get that first turn and if you don't position them well enough to begin with. So now we're on to the latest edition of our Aspect Warrior list, and that is the Crimson Hunter. So in the beginning of the edition, I would have told you that the Crimson Hunter was probably one of the worst units in the Eldar Index, simply because it just didn't do a lot of damage compared to other units in the Codex that were basically in the same role. Fire Prisms were 125 points, War Walkers were 95 points, just didn't make much sense to pay 160 for something that was essentially just two Bright Lances and a pulse laser. However, as the addition has gone on and we've seen some considerable nerfs, things like fire prisms and war walkers in their points, the Crimson Hunter by comparison is looking a lot more efficient. The Crimson Hunter is a flying aspect that specializes in eliminating enemy units with the fly keyword, of course, and as such, it gets plus one to hit and wound against targets with fly, making it extremely efficient against those targets. Hitting on a 2+, plus and wounding on a 2+, plus is something that you shouldn't scoff at. Bright Lances and a Pulse Laser make short work out of most light or medium large targets, and as a flyer, it can ignore obscuring terrain, which I think is actually its greatest asset at the moment. Titanic units no longer ignore obscuring terrain. That has been written out because it was just too OP. You had Knight Armies and Wraith Knights and things like that just dominating the battlefield. But fortunately, Flyers kept that ability. And, you know, obviously Flyers have their weaknesses, so GW thought it was okay if Flyers kept this rule. So currently, they're the only thing in the game that can ignore obscuring terrain outside of indirect fire weapons. The Crimson Hunter, as a result, pairs really well with things like the Yinkarn. And assuming the Yinkarn's ability doesn't get nerfed in this upcoming data slate, that will still be a pretty powerful combo together. So the Crimson Hunter can come out of reserve, shoot a light tank in the backfield, destroy it, and have the Yinkarn pop up where it is. It's really good at dealing with indirect fire batteries in your opponent's backfield. If your opponents bring three Manticores or three Basilisks, a bunch of Mortars or something like that, it is a good combo to deal with it. As Eldar don't really like indirect fire too much because we are a fragile, squishy faction. Their weaknesses, however, are that they can't hide and they must start from reserve. So you can't do this from turn one. You have to come in reserve and sometimes this can play a little bit of a role in it not being able to get the best positioning, which means because of its fragility and the fact that it can't also hide behind obscuring terrain itself, it often will die immediately. Because it is more fragile than our other grab tanks, and our grab tanks aren't exactly known for being durable. So once this thing goes on the battlefield, destroy something, chances are your opponent's going to see that thing in the sky and bring it down fairly quickly even with the assistance of Fade Dice. So coming in at number eight, we have Dark Reapers. Now, just because they are in the eighth spot doesn't mean I think Dark Reapers are bad. In fact, I think they have much improved over last edition's Dark Reapers, who were practically unusable. So Dark Reapers are a long-ranged aspect that specializes in killing mech targets. They ignore all negative hit modifiers, as well as the benefit of cover, making them very efficient at the target's they select. Reaper launchers have two profiles that are effective against one wound and two wound targets respectively, and the Tempest Launcher gives them access to indirect fire. So the Tempest Launcher is a great weapon. It's 2d6 blast, strength 4, AP minus 1, and of course Dark Reapers ignore all negative hit modifiers. Now it doesn't have ignores cover, of course, so your opponent's going to get a cover save against the Tempest Launcher, but you know, being able to force that many saves on an opponent is still very good in my opinion. So, you know, being able to throw out 2d6 strength 4 shots at enemy units each and every turn out of line of sight so you're safe from enemy shooting is a pretty powerful weapon. 
Not to mention the other Reaper launchers in the unit, which either have a Strength 5, AP-1, Damage 1 profile, or a Strength 8, AP-2, Damage 2 profile. So when they do have line of sight to targets, they do consistent damage against both lighter infantry targets and heavy infantry targets. Now, they do cost 80 points, and I think the main problem with Dark Reapers is twofold. One, one of the biggest weaknesses they have is that they're only movement 6, so that doesn't seem like a big deal to a lot of players out there that are just looking at them on paper, but when you do get them on the battlefield and you want to move them up ruins, it makes it a little bit awkward to do so. Because it essentially eliminates them from being able to move up ruins, up two stories of ruins, I should say, in a single turn when behind obscuring terrain. Because you need to, you know, move one inch at least to get into the obscuring terrain under the said ruin on the ground floor. And then you need to move six inches up to actually get to the top. So you can get that plunging fire. And because these guys can't advance and shoot, they kind of have to waste two turns doing this. So they are vulnerable for that crucial turn. So if your opponent really wanted to take them out, they could. But the good thing about Dark Reapers is they are also kind of cheap. Now, the other problem I mentioned, which isn't in this slide, but Dark Reapers unfortunately share a role with a lot of other units in our index that can deal with mech targets very efficiently as well. And I think currently that's what's keeping Dark Reapers from being really good is that they just don't do anything special that Dire Avengers or, you know, other Aspect Warriors or other units in our index couldn't do themselves. Now, I will say, though, that in specific matchups, Dark Reapers might actually be very clutch because of their, you know, ability to ignore negative modifiers. So stealth, you know, you see a lot of armies now with stealth and minus one to hit and a lot of things like that. And I think Dark Reapers in those situations would be a really solid pick for the low cost of 80 points. All right, so let's talk about Howling Banshees. Now, Howling Banshees haven't gotten a good reception since the drop of 10th edition. They really didn't get their points decreased by that much, and they got a lot worse. And I think they kind of shared that with a lot of other fast, lightly armored melee infantry, things like witches and stuff like that. Howling Banshees kind of suffered a similar fate. They don't do as much damage as they used to, to put it simply. And as a result, a lot of players were turned off by them. The fact that they can't really reliably kill a unit of five Space Marines means that, you know, well, what's their use, right? If they can't kill even five Space Marines, then why am I bringing them to the table? They're just going to get shot up and they're going to always trade down. So they are a fast melee aspect that specializes in precise strikes and disruption. So they're no longer going to be able to just wipe out that enemy unit you charge without some buffs or help from outside sources. But that doesn't necessarily mean they don't have a use. So they do have fights first, making them resistant to counter charges, and they have a massive threat range with advance and charge. And in that video, I talked about using this in conjunction with things like rapid ingress and reserves to leverage some control over your opponent. They also have AP-3 attacks to ensure that most opponents won't get higher than a 6-up save. And of course... The Exarch's weapons are a little bit more powerful. So you have the Executioner, which has AP minus 2, but does flat 2 damage and has a higher strength, so it's easier to wound enemy Space Marines. So, yeah, this unit has changed in the role that it plays. It is no longer a, you know, point and click delete button like it was in 9th edition. It is more of a disruption and control piece that you can use to slip behind enemy lines or prevent your opponent from making moves in certain areas of the board that you don't want your opponent to be. They are fragile though, and they don't hit particularly hard, so you do have to keep that in mind. That is a big weakness of the unit for the points cost that you pay. You do pay 85 points, which in my honest opinion is a little bit too high. I think they should probably be about 70 points, maybe at the most 75, but you know, this unit now is a disruption unit. It is a precise strike unit it's not going to be able to just take on anything in the game and come out on top anymore okay so on to the last aspect and arguably the worst in the entire index and that is the shining spears so last edition shining spears were very good they were one of the few units that could actually both kill a unit at ranged and in close combat. So what they are is they're essentially a fast combined arms aspect that specializes in running down enemy heavy infantry in close combat. 
Now, they are fairly durable when charging in. They get a 4 plus invul save when either advancing or charging, and a minus 1 to hit, which is pretty good, right? I mean, they basically have built-in stealth, but it works for combat as well. Their lance weapons ensure that they hit hard against enemy MEQ or mech targets at a high AP. They have AP3 base. I think the Star Lance might have a little bit more AP at range as well as the normal laser lances. I think they have AP minus 4 at range. They are, however, pretty durable when charging in. They get a 4 plus invul save and they have a native minus 1 to hit permanently against all attacks. Their lance weaponry ensures that they hit hard against mech targets at a high AP. Their melee weapons have an AP of minus two, and that's pretty decent. You know, it's not quite up there with the Banshees, but their weapons also have a damage two profile, so they are just killing Marines with every failed save. And because they're Lance, they're getting plus one to wound. However, they're only strength four, so they're just wounding Marines on threes, and I think the biggest two problems that Shining Spears face is that they have the fly and mounted keywords together, which make movement really awkward, especially with their large bases, and they are just not efficiently pointed. They are 120 points for three, making them 40 points a model. And yes, they are fast, but they are nowhere near Terminator points levels as far as the amount of damage that they can put out. So yes, I just think Shining Spears unfortunately suffer from a couple of the changes that 10th edition made in regards to flying and mounting and moving flying units. If they were infantry, it'd be a little different. You know, things like warp spiders, swooping hawks, they have fly, but they're also infantry, so they can just, you know, move on the ground level. If Shining Spears, for example, want to move through a ruin, they have to move up and over, it, which costs a lot of movement. And the fact that they're extremely expensive doesn't help things when they do finally get into combat they often just don't trade that well. Yes, they will kill that unit of Space Marines, but that unit of Space Marines is only 80 points, and they're 120 points, which is 50% higher than their target cost originally. So they're very points inefficient. And really, to me, this unit should be 90 points, and no more than that. The reason being is because the units they trade against are typically, you know, mech-style targets. Their points costs really aren't ever greater than 90 points, so... You know, with how awkward it is to move with this unit and how hard it is to position them correctly and how fragile they are for the cost and so forth, I really don't think you should be spending Space Marine Terminator level points on a unit that just doesn't do as much damage, isn't as durable, and quite frankly, has trouble moving throughout the battlefield. Having said all that, I do think they're a really aesthetically cool unit and they are one of the new kits that we got. So, you know, if you do run Shining Spears in your list... There's definitely a way to play them. I did a video on Shining Spears a while back. Definitely check that video out if you're interested in, you know, learning a little bit more on how to use Shining Spears in your games. But quite frankly, I think they just don't make the competitive grade. So in conclusion, I think that Aspect Warriors are on the rise and I fully expect them to take prominence in competitive lists after the January nerfs, especially units like Dire Avengers and Fire Dragons. Fire Dragons have already appeared in several competitive lists, and I expect them to be the meta Aspect Warrior unit for taking out large vehicles, monsters, and of course, really heavy infantry after January. And of course, depending on whether or not they give buffs to certain Aspect Warrior units, I think we can expect more of that as well. If there is an infantry meta, I think we can see, you know, some Dark Reapers making an appearance. I don't see Shining Spears unless they really reduce their points or change their rules around a little bit becoming prominent but you know anything could happen and you know having said that i have to say even our most underperforming aspects like howling banshees and shining spears still have useful roles in which they excel and can swing the odds in your favor so shining spears you know they are a very overcosted unit no doubt but under the right conditions they can still dish out a lot of damage a great example of this is when a unit of Shining Spears hits a enemy unit that has just disembarked from a destroyed transport. That unit will be battle-shocked and cannot benefit from any defensive stratagems or anything like that, cannot overwatch the Shining Spears, and typically at that point the Shining Spears can just have their way with them. On the other hand, units like Howling Banshees are really good at disrupting your opponent's plans or isolating and taking out key targets. 
They're especially good at taking out loan operatives is what I found with the rapid ingress stratagem. So yes, I do love Aspect Warriors and I think overall the changes have been positive from last edition to this edition. Yes, we lost a lot of customization with Exarch powers and stuff like that, but I'm sure some of those things will return in some way or another in the Elder Codex when it finally arrives. At least my fingers are crossed on that one. I know there's a chance that we won't ever see Exarch powers in 10th edition, but you know, I, I would like to see something in the Eldar Codex when it finally comes out that resembles that in some way. All right, everybody, that is going to be it for today's video. Thanks for watching, and thank you so much to my patrons and supporters who have supported the channel over the last year. Your support has helped the community and channel grow significantly, and I thank you so much for that. If you do want to help support the channel and become a Patreon member, I have free trials activated, which means you don't have to pay a single dime to join our Discord community, which is a community of Eldar players and enthusiasts who love talking about strategy, tactics, and of course, hobbying. I will leave the link to that in the description below. I'm also an Amazon affiliate and have a channel store page, so if you want to save some money on discounted Eldar miniatures via Amazon or you want to grab some Eldar-inspired apparel on my channel store page to wrap at your local game store to show your Eldar pride, I will leave the links for those in the description also. All right, everybody, that is going to be it for today. See you guys later. Have some great games this weekend, and I'll see you guys in the next video. Have a good one, everybody. Peace out.